Hello, is that better? Okay, great. Okay, hello, I'm uh, Michael Weiss. I'm postdoctoral associate with the Responsible Governance and Sustainable Citizenship Project here at UNH. Uh, it's called RGSCP for short. And uh, I'm happy to welcome you to the second lecture in our Ethics of Wealth lecture series. Uh, and today's lecture is co-sponsored by the Religious Studies Program in the Department of History. And the title is Destiny or Oppression? Early Christian Explanations for Poverty and Wealth in the Roman Empire. Our speaker today is Stephen J. Friesen, Professor of Religious Studies and uh, Louise Boyer, Chair of Biblical Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. He is an expert on wealth inequality in the Roman Empire, is the author of two books on the Roman imperial cult, and has published widely on early Christianity within the economic and social context of the Roman Empire, including the ways in which early Christians interpreted the causes of wealth and poverty uh, in the world around them. It is a pleasure and honor to have him speak with us today, and I ask you all to help join me extending a warm welcome to Professor Stephen Friesen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Let's, uh, appreciate the welcome we've gotten here so far. A little bit wetter than I was expecting from coming from Austin, Texas, but uh, it's nice to see how the rest of the country lives. And, uh, um, also commend you on the, uh, the topics that you're taking up this year. Uh, inequality is a topic that many people don't like to talk about. Or I should say people like to talk about it more if the topic is charity. If the topic is helping someone in need. If you start asking why, do those, why are those people in need at the first place, it often gets a little bit trickier. And that's why I thought I'd put this um, quote from Dom Elder Kammer up here to, be, to begin our thinking about this, because he raises this issue, charity or structural change. Uh, Kammer was a, British, uh, a Brazilian uh, churchman, archbishop of Olinda and Recife. He worked, spent a good deal of his career working among the poorest of the poor in Brazil. And... Um, one of the many quotable items that came from him is this one. He said, when I give food to the poor, they call me a saint. When I ask why the poor have no food, they call me a communist. And there he was getting at his own experience of the difficulty of shifting from a discussion of how do we help people who are in need to asking why are those people in need at the first place? in the first place. And that, that's a dynamic that I want to explore today. Uh, I might as well admit now I'm not going to solve that problem for you. What I have in mind instead is to give us some things to think about and to talk about together. Uh, and uh, when I say some things, I mean specifically uh, four early Christian texts, roughly from uh, they're all within about 50 years of each other, and uh, written from different parts of the Roman Empire, diff two different audiences. But they give us not a Chris early Christian opinion of wealth and poverty, but they give us a range of opinions that don't really actually agree with each other. And so what I will be doing over the next few minutes is talking about uh, four different models for thinking about poverty, wealth, and inequality from these earliest Christian texts. The Book of Revelation, uh, which gives us more of a, a view of systemic oppression. Uh, the Letter of James, which talks more about local exploitation. Acts of the Apostles, which uh, doesn't really give us much of an answer at all on the question that uh, we're asking, but gives us some things to think about on it. And finally, Shepherd of Hermas. If you have heard of three of four of the three out of four of these, you're doing pretty good. The first three are all in the Christian New Testament. Shepherd of Hermas is a text that didn't quite make it, didn't make the cut into the New Testament, uh, but it's an important early Christian text, so we'll come back and talk about it a little bit. So what I want to do here is lay out sort of four different ways that we can see in the early Christian text that Christians were thinking about the inequality 
in their society. But that, uh, the, the starting point here, I think, is that first question, and that's uh, how much inequality was there in the Roman Empire? I need to start out a little bit and think about, about the, um, the context for these texts. And uh, I, how long ago? Several years ago, I started um, looking into this issue of the econ economic pol uh, practices of early churches, and I was surprised at how little is written about this in New Testament studies. Um, it was actually fairly disappointing. And when I started looking at questions of poverty in particular, um, the, it seemed like the reigning consensus in New Testament studies was poverty wasn't a problem, so we don't really need to talk about it. And that was basically the position in New Testament studies from about 1980 to the present. And there's starting to be some rumblings on that issue, but basically, we don't need to think about how, what early churches did about wealth and poverty because poverty wasn't an issue in the Roman Empire. It wasn't a very satisfying answer. So I began moving more into Roman studies and looking at people who studied the Roman Empire more broadly and not necessarily on New Testament or like Christianity or religious movements. And I started looking there and found some help. I found uh, people like Peter Garnsey and uh, Richard Soller to be uh, um, good, uh, common sense voices of specialists who, who talked about the Roman system of inequality. Looking at the way that inequality in the Roman Empire was shaped. Um, but uh, th my sense of it is in Roman studies there's a lot of disagreement about where, uh, where we should come down on this issue. How much inequality was there in the Roman Empire. And in fact the last 10-15 oh, years there have been several people writing about uh, focusing more on the middle class or middlers. Sometimes they don't like to talk about class in the ancient world, but talking about middlers uh, or middle class and saying, well, it's kind of more, there were more middlers than, uh, than we thought there were. Maybe the Roman Empire was fairly prosperous or more prosperous than we thought. This made me suspicious. And so I started working on this and trying to, what made me suspicious was these tended to be um, anecdotal arguments. By that I mean, they would take a piece of uh, material from the ancient world and say, well look, this is surprising how much uh, luxury there is here. And that bothered me because it's hard, we have fragmentary data from the ancient world to begin with, but when we don't try to put it in a larger context, it, um, I'm not sure what we can build on. So I started trying to so how can we measure inequality? How can we kind of come up with a scale to, so I know what to, we're talking, we don't even really know what we're arguing about until we have come to terms and say this is what I think it was. So I came up, uh, started working on a scale of uh, income to measure income and how many people had that kind of income. And it got kind of interesting. I ended up um, bringing a, getting a Roman historian by the name of Walter Scheidel involved in this project because I was quickly getting to, into topics that were beyond my training and I needed a, a real economist to work some of this out. And uh, we came up with a, uh, a scale to try to measure poverty and wealth in the Roman Empire. I'm going to show you a couple numbers here. Um, yeah, there's going to be a chart or two. I hope it's not too painful for you. And uh, if I lose you, feel free to ask me about it or uh, raise your hand. But uh, this is what we, what we uh, came up with. It's, uh, first of all, notice uh, that we're working on sort of two possibilities, a pessimistic model of the economy and an optimistic model of the economy. In other words, if the Roman Empire was, was chugging along as, uh, as efficiently as it could, given that it was a pre-industrial economy, how big would that economy be? What could, what, what's the best possible outcome out of an economy for that area? Roughly 70 million people. And then on the other side, what's, uh, what's the worst possible? And at what point does the economy produce so little that people are doing so poorly that the, the system implodes, the system falls apart? And uh, these are this HS stands for sesterti, a kind of measurement of uh, a Roman uh, coinage. Uh, 
And the, when you think about a pre-industrial economy with advanced agriculture and the kind of technology the Roman Empire had, you had to have an economy somewhere around these two figures. So that gives us some parameters. And then we said, okay, then if people are earning certain amounts of money, you can kind of plug that all in. Um, for example, on the pessimistic model, if, if the economy is chugging along at about 17 billion sesterti per year, then uh, you have these categories, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000. These are like family earnings for the year. And you put percentages in here. That all has to add up, right? People can't be earning more money than the economy is producing. Now that, to me, I like, that was very exciting. I, I get excited about these sort of things. And if you I hope you'll forgive me. But uh, it's, uh, it, uh, it's exciting because it gets us away from this. This is the category of middlers, that middle class. The, um, that a lot of people have talked about how this may be large, larger than we thought. But at a certain point, if this gets too large and they're earning these kinds of amounts of money, can the economy bear that? Do we have a place for these people down here and people up above? That's the idea. There's, it's kind of a zero-sum game. You can't expand the middle class too much. You can't expand any of these too much if you want to stay within what the economy could do. So that's the idea behind this chart. Um, as I mentioned, these are in, oops, these are in thousands. Uh, so people, families that earned around a, in the thousands, the 2000s, so sturdy per year, three, four, five. And uh, then there were a lot of people down here earning less than a thousand, so I had to put it into, uh, divide it up into quarters. Now most of you probably don't get paychecks in the denomination of sesterti, so this doesn't really mean a lot to you. So we um, tried to describe what this means in, in, in translatable terms. The red here is important because um, that's our calculation of what it would cost to keep a, f a family of four people alive, just in terms of you got to get calories into the people to keep them alive. Need a little bit of clothing, maybe a little bit of heating. That comes out at 572 sesterti per year. So that gives us kind of a baseline. And then working, uh, working with uh, figures that have been developed in other parts of the world and developing parts of the world, uh, different kinds of economies, they note that when you get up here around toward two times subsistence level, often a family is able to have work animals, but not grain fed. That takes a little bit more. Now, right away, you see there's a different kind of economy than most of us are living in, but it gives us a way to think about the Roman economy in systematic terms. So if we have these kinds of income categories, uh, how can we, and we have a sense of the economy as rough, roughly somewhere in this, in this range, how, how, where do people live? How can we divide that up so that it makes sense in, ter in economic terms? And let's start down here uh, at the bottom, which is where most people had to um, live uh, in economic terms. And the figures come out something like this. Even on the optimistic scenario, you've got more than half the people living around subsistence level. Maybe a little, some, time, you know, some years are better, some years are worse, but on average, you have to have something like this. Uh, people are a little bit above that in this range, 8 to 19 percent. And when you add this up, you realize already you've got, uh, what, 80, 90 percent of the population living around subsistence. Above that, you get into a category with people more uh, um, disposable income. And the figures come out something like this. You see it decreasing fairly rapidly as you go up one from the thousands, the two thousands, the three thousand, four thousand, five thousands. And it gets you up to about 10 or 11 per, uh, times what it costs to keep a family alive. Now this, we need to deal with this top section. This is, this is uh, 
a category of people who had enough money to be involved in government. We know from the Roman world that you had to have about an income of six, you had to have wealth that would produce about 6,000 sesterti a year in order to be involved in city government. And so we have a couple categories like this. The decurian level, that's the level of income that would qualify you in city government. Equestrians, which is more, uh, more of a Roman category, and then a senatorial level. Which is there are what, 600, of, 600 men served as senators in Rome. So we're getting up to the top of the political hierarchy, and we know something about how much they would need to earn to, to be in that category. And you might notice over here, this, uh, the numbers all of a sudden start jumping. This is 6,000 to 23,000 is at the uh, city government level. 24 to 74 is the level of income that gets you in the, you could qualify for the question level if you have other kinds of contacts and above. I couldn't put a chart like this on. It would, you know, what, it'd go up a few stories, right? And you begin to see a, a sense of the level of inequality that had to exist. And we have examples of uh, known examples from the ancient world of people who are well above this, this amount. And uh, the numbers, however, come out to be a very small portion of the population. That's, it's made somewhere around one, one and a half percent the population at that level. And another way of thinking about this is how much income would each of these categories uh, be uh, capturing. Uh, let's start down here where you've got about 90% of the population. They're capturing about 50% of the income. In the middler range, around 10%, is 15, 25%. And these folks up here are capturing a good deal more. Now that's one way of thinking about the Roman Empire and the system of inequality that existed in the ancient world, as best we can measure it, as best we can model it, really. This is, these are calculations, highly disciplined calculations, actually that I've uh, summarized here to give us a sense of economic inequality in this pre-industrial economy. But quality of life is more than just money, right? There are other things that go into that. And uh, just putting it in these economic terms makes it a little bit difficult to really fill out as a, as a good picture of what was going on. So I've tried to enhance that a little bit with one more chart. And this has to do more with quality of life factors. People who measure, try to do comparisons across the world and also across, uh, sometimes across historical periods, talk about different ways that you can compare uh, wellness. And I've tried to uh, gather some information. These are actually uh, 2008, figures from 2008 is where I could get the figures together of several countries to help us think about the Roman Empire, which is uh, down here. Of course, they're in Sesterti, so that's, uh, uh, and so that's a little bit hard to, to uh, capture in terms of monetary terms. But we can think about urban population. What percentage of people in the, urban, in the Roman Empire lived in an urban setting? And uh, how does it compare to countries we know? Uh, those of us who are living in the US, about 82% urban population. Roman Empire, more 10 to 15%. So that right away tells us there's a very different uh, economy that we're thinking about in this, that is the context for these texts. Or a f fertility rate. Uh, this is uh, defined as number of births for a woman who reaches the end of her, who lives long enough to reach the end of her reproductive years. And uh, nowadays in industrial economies, you see this coming in at around two or three uh, with very different kinds of variations. And uh, in the Roman Empire, you have uh, a very different figure, about six to nine births. 
Anyone have a sense of why that is? Yeah, infant mortality. Got to remember that uh, early childhood up to about the age of 10 is pretty dangerous. You all have survived those years. The, uh, but in, bef before the advent of modern medicine, we're talking about up to 40 or 50 percent of children uh, would die before the age of 10. And so uh, that uh, puts an increased pressure on, uh, on uh, families, and on, especially on women, to reproduce the population. Also, contraception is another factor that affects this. Uh, in terms of life expectancy, uh, people have tried to calculate this um, for the Roman Empire. This is a little bit deceptive. The life expectancy, life expectancy of 20 to 30 years, it's a little bit deceptive because of what we were talking about before. So many children die early that it throws the numbers off. So this number 45 here is for people who survive to age 10, there's a life expectancy of about 45. It'd be an average age. Some would live longer, uh, some less. Uh, infant mortality, which I mentioned before, uh, this is infant mortality in terms of up death before age one. Uh, these are sort of figures that have been put together. These last two are a little bit difficult to compare, but I thought I'd put them up here anyway. Children underweight. Give you a sense. The, the point of this is when we're thinking about the Roman Empire, thinking about life in the Roman Empire and economic inequality, we're probably talking more about a situation something like Uganda than uh, Australia or Norway or the US. And I want to let that sink in a little bit because our natural tendency is to imagine them like our own experience. So when we're talking about these early Christian texts, they're talking about an economy, a social economy, a social setting that is quite a bit different than ours. So those are the charts, those are the numbers. Uh, as a way of setting a little bit of uh, context, I'd like to move on now to these four texts and see what they say about what it's like to live in this setting. And the uh, first one uh, I'll talk briefly about is the book of Revelation. If you're thinking about a spectrum of these in terms of the destiny or oppression uh, uh, spectrum, does poverty, does inequality come from uh, something we can change or is it something that, that is uh, not uh, there is part of destiny. Revelation ends up on the, uh, on the oppression side pretty heavily for these four texts, and we'll kind of move across that, that spectrum. Book of Revelation, uh, anybody read it recently? Anybody think they understand it? It's a, it's a tough text, and uh, it's made more difficult by the sorts of interpretations we get out from popular culture. Looking at it in historical terms, there's some, some of the symbols are not actually so obscure. Uh, one of the main characters in the book of Revelation is the Roman Empire as a character. The Roman Empire comes up as a beast. In chapter 13, we, first we are first introduced to this beast. The beast is described as having seven heads, ten horns, speaking blasphemous things. It makes war on the whole world, defeats everyone. Where does it get this power? According to Revelation 13, its power comes from Satan, from the dragon. In Revelation's terms, the great cosmic dragon, the opponent of God. And we meet this uh, beast. It's called the beast from the sea, the beast that comes up from the sea that uh, makes war on the world. In chapter 17 and 18, this image from our author gets expanded. The author's writing late in the first century, 
people say maybe the years 80 to 100, somewhere in that range, and uh, has given us a, the, the, the Roman Empire as beast. In chapter 17, the beast image is expanded. Now the Roman Empire is portrayed as a great prostitute riding on the beast. It's this composite image, the seven-headed, ten-horned beast. And actually, probably a better translation is the great whore. It's a very derogatory text presenting the Roman Empire as a highly paid prostitute who is clothed in scarlet, clothed in purple, adorned with gold and jewels, as a golden goblet full of the abomina abominable things of the world, and she is drunk on the blood of the saints. That's the image we get for the Roman Empire in the book of Revelation. As the text moves on into uh, chapter 18, then we begin to see the text do an analysis of the Roman Empire. It's not the kind of analysis that we're used to in a North American higher education setting. It's a visionary analysis. It's poetry. It's, it's oracles. It's uh, symbolic. But we begin to see the author fleshing out the, his ideas about how the Roman Empire exploits the world. Just got a couple verses from Revelation here for us to look at. After this, that's after John sees the vision of the beast and the great whore. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was made bright with his splendor. He called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. I should say a word about Babylon the Great. This, uh, this um, before we go on, the, this uh, whore is named Babylon. Why Babylon? It's a symbol for Rome. And the way it works is this. Babylon was the first world power to destroy Israel's temple in Jerusalem first world power to come in and destroy the center of Israel's religious and political life. And so Babylon was remembered as the one that did, uh, executed this blasphemous act against the God of Israel. That was in the 6th century BCE. This happened again under the Romans in the year 70 CE, in the first century. And so calling Rome, Babylon made a lot of sense and drew, drew on Israel's history as a way of denouncing this blasphemous world power. So our author can talk about Rome as Babylon, as the great whore, and uh, then gives us this, this oracle, this lament, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, has become a dwelling place of demons, a haunt of every foul and hateful bird, a haunt of every foul and hateful beast. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. The merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxury. Now, I've highlighted a couple of terms here to, to help you see a couple of themes that our author presents for us as his analysis of how does the empire work? How does this imperial system work? Where does this inequality come from? And he highlights kings, the people, and the merchants. And if you go through chapter 18, uh, you see this coming up again. This is, this is not simply uh, in one verse, but it's a theme that comes through here. The kings of the earth are the ones who are engaging the prostitute. There's a game of power and money and pleasure going on in his political analysis that involves the political rulers. The nations, the peoples, are the ones who are drunk from this, uh, what put as drunk on the wine of the wrath of her fornication, as a, what, a secondary phenomenon coming out of this political machinations, 
The whole world has become drunk. And who's making the money off of it? Well, the merchants. And the merchants are making it happen, according to our author. And the kings of the earth are uh, also uh, accumulating vast sums of money. So in, the, in this verse, we see an, an example of how our author is analyzing wealth and poverty and inequality in, in the empire. It's an unjust system that's exploiting most of the people uh, and deceiving them. A kind of drunkenness that has come down on everyone. The author also has suggestions of how people ought to act. And that's part of what we want to think about. Not only how do, they, how do these texts analyze the Roman Empire, but how do they, what kind of suggestions do they make for us in terms of how people should act. The, tech, the uh, verses go on, then I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, so that you do not take part in her sins, so that you do not share in her plagues. For her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. What kind of ethic is this? It's an ethic of withdrawal, of not becoming involved in this dominant system, keeping oneself pure, staying away from the imperial machinations that have generated this unjust system. That's one model, one way that early Christians are thinking about inequality in the empire. A second text is the letter of James. This is uh, found in the Christian New Testament. It's short text, five, six chapters. It's probably written sometime in the second half of the first century, maybe even fairly close to the, book of Re the time of the book of Revelation. It claims the authority of James, and uh, this is actually a bad translation. The name is Jacob. Anyone else with this name in the ancient world, we would translate their name Jacob, but the one in the Bible gets translated James. Um, and this is the Jacob who is remembered as Jesus' brother. Jesus' brother who apparently was not a follower of Jesus until after the crucifixion and the resurrection visions. James, Jacob, becomes one of the leaders in the Jerusalem church. And this text is, uh, claims to be either it claims to be written by him. It's a little, it's pretty good Greek for a Galilean fisher or a carpenter. And so uh, people have raised questions about it. It may be a little bit later, but it's invoking that kind of authority. And uh, here, there's a, again a sensitivity to exploitation in this text, but it looks at it a little bit differently. It looks at it not so much as a systemic problem, but as a localized problem, more along the lines of large land, land owners who are making their money off of the labor of their workers. A couple of texts to get a, get a flavor of this, this particular text uh, letter. This is from James 5. Come now, you rich people. Weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted. Your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted. And their rust will be evidence against you. And it will eat your flesh like fire. You've laid up treasure for the last days. Listen. The wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which, kept you back, which you kept back by fraud, those wages cry out, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You've lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You've fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You've condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. Now, as I read this, I think I haven't really heard many good sermons on this text. And you might imagine why. It's a pretty provocative text 
and in, in it's close to revelation in that it condemns wealth and the, the ill-gotten gains that come out of this system. But it's not looking at empire, shippers, uh, nations. It's looking more at a localized setting and the way employers exploit their laborers. So one more text I want us to look at from James um, that gives us a little more sense of what sort of ethical imperative does it give us? What, what does it tell us we should do in these kinds of situations? This is from James 2, and the uh, author imagines a, set, uh, a fictional setting of a rich man and a poor man coming into the meeting. And here I've translated the uh, a term as synagogue, because that's actually what the Greek says. In most transla Christian translations, it comes out as assembly or congregation or meeting or something like that. Um, but in chapter 2, the author says, My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your synagogue, and if a poor person in dirty clothes comes in, if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there, sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it, is it not the rich who oppress you? It's not, is it not they who drag you into courts? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? I think this is a fascinating text in many ways. One of the things the author is doing here is, uh, along with the author's criticism of the Roman system of inequality at a local level, the author is uh, addressing the audience and saying, you have absorbed that mentality. You, you, you have been colonized by this power. And so here the ethical imperative is not quite pull back and withdraw. He's, the author seems to be doing something different than Revelation. What's, what's the, what, uh, is the, what is the author trying to get us to do here? Some kind of treat people equally, no matter what distinctions are made in uh, the social system in which they live. There's at least uh, a sense that uh, the author is criticizing them for having internalized the ethics of their setting. So we have one text denouncing the Roman imperial system, another one looking more locally and promoting a different kind of engagement. I'm going to move on to a third text, which is uh, Acts of the Apostles. This is uh, also in the, can the Christian canon in the New Testament. It's uh, written by the same author that wrote the Gospel according to Luke. So we have two large volumes by one author. In the gospel, it's talking about the life of Jesus, the death and the resurrection visions. Acts of the Apostles begin, takes the story further and tries to chart how the author understands the expansion of the churches. Arguments, there are arguments about when it was written. Some people would say written as early as 80. Some people say 120, 130, second, early second century. For our purposes, it's enough to know that we're, we're dealing with early Christian texts uh, from a variety of, of perspectives. And in Acts, you get a very different reading of inequality and uh, poverty and wealth. I think if you, if you think about a, a spectrum, we're moving over now into this, uh, across the divide from the exploitation in, uh, side of the spectrum into another uh, another area of analysis. I think it's interesting that Acts does not actually 
uh, give us any explanation of why there's inequality. It's a fascinating text in that it has stories of Paul interacting with really wealthy people and high government officials, tell stories that Paul never gives us in his letters, but has him interacting easily with highly placed people and uh, suggests more ease with that. And primarily, this text advises us that charity is the way to handle inequality. In contrast to Revelation and James, there's no analysis of, of uh, inequality, of the system, uh, no sense of why it's caused. There is one really interesting thing at the beginning of the text for, for this question, however, and that's that uh, the, the Acts of the Apostles early on has a couple of stories of voluntary redistribution of wealth. It gets stories of the churches sharing their resources. It's in chapters 2 and 4. Um, this is uh, the section from 2. It kind of comes at the end of a story, and the, the author is uh, summing things up and giving us uh, an editorial comment about what was going on. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And then in chapter 4, the author returns to this theme again. This is a fascinating economic practice that this text tells us about. We don't have records of this from anywhere else. And actually, once the author talks about this early on, the first churches in Jerusalem, this practice is left behind and never really comes up again. Instead, we get um, not redistribution, not trying to implement some other kind of system for the economy of the churches, uh, but uh, it relies rather on charity. There are several characters throughout Tabitha, a Jewish woman, early on is uh, recognized. Cornelius, uh, a Roman centurion who converts, is the story of Acts. If, you've, uh, if you're familiar with it, it goes, uh, takes the last half of it is Paul traveling around to different churches. And in these churches, he's gaining many Gentile converts. And there, it seems to be charity is the, is the operational term. Give to people when they're in need but with little sense of any kind of critique of the Roman imperial system. One last text I want us to think about is the Shepherd of Hermas. Probably not many of you have encountered this, this text. It's called the Shepherd of Hermas uh, for this reason. The main character is a freed slave. His name is Hermas. He used to be a slave. He's been uh, freed by his former owner. And now in this, this very long text, actually, Hermas receives different revelations. Most of the revelations come from a supernatural figure who looks like a shepherd. And that's where the title comes from. The shepherd of Hermas delivers revelations to him of various sorts. Sometimes they're commandments, sometimes they're visions. And then the two that uh, we're interested in for the question of inequality are parables. People argue about when it was written. It's probably somewhere between 110 and 140, early, the first half of the second century. And although it's not in any of your Bibles now, I'm certain of that, uh, in the first centuries there were significant arguments among the churches whether the shepherd of Hermas ought to be given the same status the, uh, as the Gospels or Acts or some of the other texts that eventually were included in the New Testament. So we have an important early Christian text. And this one takes us to the far side of the spectrum where wealth comes from God and apparently poverty does as well. 
It's a very different mindset. And uh, you can see that by a couple of, uh, two of the parables that are revealed by the shepherd to Hermas. Uh, first parable is, uh, uses a city metaphor. Uh, and uh, the idea is that Christians are slaves of God, and God has sent them to do his work in another country. In other words, life on this earth. And the shepherd spins out this, uh, this parable. He, that's the shepherd, spoke to me, Hermas. You know, he said, that you who are servants of God are living in a foreign country, for your city is far from this city. If therefore you know, he said, your city in which you are destined to live, heaven in other words, why do you prepare fields and expensive possessions and buildings and useless rooms here? Instead of fields, then, purchase souls that have been afflicted insofar as you can, and take care of widows and orphans, and do not neglect them. Spend your wealth and all your furnishings for such fields and houses as you have received from God. For this is why the Master made you rich, that you may carry out these ministries for him. It's much better to purchase the fields, goods, and houses you find in your own city, in other words, Revelation, uh, uh, heaven, when you return to it. This kind of extravagance is good and makes one glad. It has no grief or fear, but joy instead. And so do not participate in the extravagance sought by outsiders, for it is of no profit for those who are slaves of God. This is a fairly long piece. I've, I've just uh, excerpted it here for you. And uh, this is interesting because you see some of the same uh, ethical in, uh, advice that uh, comes from the Hebrew Bible and much early Christian teaching, take care of widows and orphans. However, you notice this whole text seems to be mostly about wealthy people, addressing wealthy people. What do you do with your wealth? The attention, if you think back to Revelation, the attention has shifted from addressing people further down that inequality scale to people further up and how do they how can they be believers and yet be wealthy and parable one tells us you be, you do that by using your some of your wealth for the master's purposes it assumes that fields will still be bought houses will be bought but some of that wealth is to be used for widows and orphans. Second parable goes a little bit further. And uh, this one uh, uses a, uh, an agricultural metaphor. Uh, that this is the uh, shepherd speaking again. This vine, he said, bears fruit. That's the grapevine. But the elm is a fruitless tree. But unless it climbs the elm, this vine cannot bear much fruit when it's spread out on the ground. And what fruit it does bear is rotten, because it is not suspended from the elm. So when the vine is attached to the elm, it bears fruit both from itself and from the elm. You see, therefore, that the elm also bears much fruit, not less than the vine, but even more. OK, you may be thinking, what's going on here? It's because uh, this text is referring to an agricultural practice from Italy in which you have trees that are cultivated to be a trellis for vines. And uh, I looked up, found a couple of archival shots of this uh, still being practiced in Italy. Uh, you get elm trees that are being pruned and uh, used as grape trellises. Or um, this is uh, an Another uh, one, this is a field maple, actually. You can see the tree here, and the vines grow up, uh, up the tree. The tree, is, the tree itself does not produce fruit, but it becomes the trellis that allows the vine to produce fruit. So this is the metaphor that uh, the text is working with. If we go back to that text, I think what's surprising to me is that this text suggests that it's actually you know, the rich people are the tree, the poor people are the vine, and uh, it suggests that the rich people are actually the ones who are doing all the work. And uh, this apparently surprises uh, 
Hermas as well. And so he asks, how, sir, I asked, does it bear more fruit? How is it the rich are more productive than the poor? Because, the shepherd said, the vine, when, it, when hanging on the elm, bears its fruit in abundance and in good condition. But when it, the vine, is spread out on the ground, it bears little fruit. And what it does bear is rotten. So this parable is applicable to God's servants, to poor and rich alike. How so, sir, I asked. Explain this to me. Listen, he said, the rich have much wealth, but are poor in the things of the Lord, being distracted by their wealth, and they have very little confession and prayer with the Lord. And what they do is small and weak and has no power above. So whenever the rich go up to the poor and supply them their needs, they believe that what they do for the poor will be able to find a reward from God because the poor are rich in intercession and confession. And their intercession has great power with God. The rich, therefore, unhesitatingly provide the poor with everything. And the poor, being provided by, for by the rich, pray for them, thanking God for those who share with them. And the rich, in turn, are all the more zealous on behalf of the poor in order that they may lack nothing in their life. For the rich know that the intercession of the poor is acceptable and rich before God. And this parable ends with the shepherd repeating, so it's actually the rich who do are more productive. This text takes us below, be, further than the charity perspective of Acts. This, to me, looks kind of like some codependency problem of rich and poor. Um, the rich being poor in spirituality, the economically poor being uh, rich in spirituality. And so what they're, what? Is there any way out of this conundrum? The, uh, they keep uh, working this dysfunctional system. Well, that's, uh, I'm going to conclude, tie things together here. We, I've tried to give us a sense of the context for some of these early Christian texts and early Christian thinking about wealth and poverty by thinking about the Roman Empire. And then go through a couple of the texts that talk about wealth and poverty and inequality from a Christian perspective, and it comes out something like this. They give us a, a range of opinions on the origin of poverty. Anything from poverty comes from Satan's imperial system to poverty comes from God. What should the poor do? Revelation remains separate on one end. Hermas become dependent on the wealthy. Thank, be thankful for their, their generosity toward you. And then a couple of positions in the middle. What about the rich? What kind of uh, advice do we get for the rich? Well, Revelation would give them roughly the same advice as the poor. Divest of your interests. Stay separate from the imperial system. To the other end of the spectrum, the shepherd of Hermas the rich should give to the poor and support them. And finally, what's the goal of all this? In all these texts, uh, we see a variety of goals being pursued by our authors. Revelation, it seems to be purity, faithfulness. In James, there's more of an emphasis, there's still a critique, but more of an emphasis on pr producing something closer to equality. Acts, seems to be trying to alleviate individual needs. And Hermas, the goal of this uh, advice is the person, personal salvation, especially of the rich. So when we get to the end of this discussion, we don't get one Christian position on wealth, poverty, and inequality. We get four at least four.
that are in conflict with each other. They present us with a, an, an, uh, the chance to think about our own analyses of inequality and our own conclusions about how we might act in the face of that inequality. So I'd like to, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing your questions and comments on this. Thank you for your attention. Okay, we have time for uh, questions and answers. So if you would like to have questions for Professor Friesen. Um, I'm going to come around with the microphone if you have any questions. I also want to mention, um, particularly for you, Professor McMahon, there are cookies and coffee outside, so there's also a little bit of time for informal <coughs> questions uh, after this formal question and answer period. I have suddenly blinded myself. I'm sorry. Hi. Uh, you mentioned four different views up there. Do you have any ideas on which ones were more dominant? Uh, uh, which ones were more dominant? I think uh, Revelation was uh, least dominant, uh, at least uh, overall over the, the course of uh, decades and centuries. Uh, different research project I'm working right now, I'm working on right now is reception of Revelation in the second century, in the century after it was written. And you can begin to see already in the second century people trying to come to grips with this text and trying to give, find some other reading of it than, uh, than this strong anti-imperial approach. Looks to me like uh, over on this end of the spectrum is where historically churches tend to come down because these are more stable. They uh, they tend to work better within a functioning system than these kinds of critiques. Probably Acts has the advantage of having been built into the canon. Um, but in, uh, if you think over Christian literature over the long haul, you see uh, this kind of spirituality the poor, uh, or this kind of attitude, the poor are spiritual and, and the rich uh, have so many cares, uh, all the wealth that they need to take care of that uh, they get distracted. So if the wealthy give to the poor, then the poor can pray for them. And between the two of them, they, get, they can uh, take care of each other and everyone can attain salvation. That's, that has also been a strong theme within Christian spirituality, even if... Uh, Shepherd of Hermas itself didn't make it into the canon. Hi, thank you so much for coming today in well. this rainy weather. But um, with your chart at the beginning of your presentation, it showed that the majority of wealthy people were involved in Roman government um, and the higher ups of society. So would Christianity had um, spread throughout um, the more wealthy people as well, even though they were probably a part of the government. And I know that Saul or Paul was involved with prosecuting Jews, but more from like a pagan standpoint, would they have been attracted to Christianity as well? Um, over the course of a, uh, about 150 years from the time of the New Testament on, you can, you can see more involvement of Christians in government. Uh, at, in the early stages, not so much. In fact, we don't have, I don't, you know, there are no names of believers at least into the second century that I can think of, of who held any kind of public office. Uh, at least that are not, that are identified. Our, our, our um, information is fragmentary. And that's because because in the early years, this is sort of the range that, that uh, the churches, where the churches uh, found members uh, in, in this area. By about the um, late second into the third century, there's signs of churches incorporating people who are further up the scale, 
to the point where they uh, are able to serve in government. Also, um, I just there's a reference. There's a third cent in the middle of third cent, about 250. There is a bishop from Alexandria by the name of I think it was Demetrius, who is able to um, put up money to uh, support the city's grain supply for the year. Now, Alexandria was a huge city. That's that's a huge undertaking. That's a kind of thing that could happen in the third century, but in the first century, we don't have any records like that. So the issue of government uh, government participation was not uh, really an option for most believers in the early decades, at least maybe the early century. Is your economic model here based on the late Roman Empire or sort of a, um, a broad spectrum analysis yeah. of the empire? And furthermore, is it based on Rome proper, i.e. like the Italian peninsula or the entirety of mm. the late Roman Empire? Yeah, yeah, good detail questions. I, I didn't want to get in too much detail and I was laying it out, but those are important considerations. This chart is based roughly on a uh, high point of the Roman Empire, mid second century. And it assumes uh, a population of about 70 million. And it's attempting to deal with the whole empire, not just one area. In that sense, it's a very broad, abstract model. And that's both its power and its weakness, because it gives us a framework for thinking about the whole empire. When you try to think about what was happening in Athens, then you get into particularities that don't quite fit the model. And you have to come, you come to grips with that in a little bit different way. But this sets parameters. It's um, um, the way it, these models are uh, generated is through sort of three lines of argument. One is uh, consumption. How much would 70 mil million people consume, and how would that be produced and distributed? One is uh, through income. It's like consumption is one kind of argument. Income is another way of getting at it. Um, how much did people earn from records we can tell? And uh, generating a, a larger model from that method. So you have income consumption. The third way is uh, that this model is established is from other historical periods. Uh, economic historians studied economies in various periods and have a sense of what an economy can do and can't do in a, in a given setting. And so by getting sort of, sort of these three lines of argument, you, you generate this circle that comes up with this. This is the area in which the Roman Empire had to operate. Unless you want to think that it was phenomenally successful beyond any other empire in the pre-industrial period, uh, which is highly unlikely. Thank you. Um, in the text of uh, James, you mentioned about the uh, local exploitation between the uh, region. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, so, like in this process of exploitation, like was any uh, the land conflict between the rich and poor involved? The land cl conflict between rich and poor. Ah, poor. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, yeah. The uh, another part of the Roman uh, economy that I didn't get to get into is that we tend to what we think of an economy as what capital based or money based or something like that and. In the Roman Empire, it's the real basis for wealth is land. And you have a tendency for uh, large landholders uh, leasing out their land to farmers, uh, sharecropping. And so uh, people who are sharecropping have to raise enough for their, uh, for their family and then also give it, Estimates vary, maybe 20, 30 percent back to the owner. And that's one, one important model for how the land gets distributed. There are also small land, land holders in some areas. 
but um, it looks like the uh, letter of James is referring to those sort of situations where you have large landowners who uh, are using laborers or sharecroppers to farm their land. It's the same sort of thing you see references to in the Gospels as well. Parables talk about uh, landowners renting out their land and going away, coming back. Those, those sort of parables refer to the same sort of land system, land use system. How is it a um, exploitation? Um, from the point of view of the letter of James, it's exploitation because the owners are not are withholding wages. They're paying them as little as they can, maybe even paying them less than they said they would, and uh, profiting for themselves out of that labor. So we have time for one more, I think, before we can devour the cookies and coffee. Does anyone have anything? Uh, well, this is um, quite revealing, especially the fact that um, there's not so much focus on issues of poverty and riches in the, um, what will you call them now? Uh, not in the gospel, but in the epistles, mm -hmm. the letters that follow. Especially because the impression you get is that the, there's a lot of focus in the gospels on, the, on issues of poverty, of taking care mm -hmm. of the poor. Uh, you will expect that the letters of the, uh, the disciples and the followers will be filled with preoccupation with issues of poverty. Mm -hmm. But it appears as if they just made references to this issue by default, not really subject of major focus. Mm -hmm. And Paul seems to be completely off the record. Yeah. I mean, how do you explain this? Is it that yeah. the question. Po yeah. poverty was already becoming a virtue during this period uh -huh. for the yeah. Christians? Um, yeah, when I began this project, I started skimming through different early Christian texts, and was, I was astonished at how f few of those texts addressed my question. How few of the texts actually talked about, why is there inequality? Why is there wealth? Why is there poverty? Um, the Gospels do have references to it, but they're they're much more complicated documents uh, because of the way they came together. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to come to grips with the Gospels, and so I left them out of this. The reference to Paul's letters. Paul says almost nothing about this, except Paul un engages in one really interesting experiment. Um, Paul decides he's going to gather a collection of money for the Jerusalem church. and. The idea is his Gentile congregations should be gathering up money for the, for the poor in the Jerusalem church. And he says it's because there ought, to be an equal, there ought to be equality among the churches. Someday you'll have need, you Gentiles, and maybe uh, then they will supply your needs. So it looks like he's experimenting with some kind of redistribution um, but it's not clear if that succeeded at all. In fact, when you look at it carefully, it looks like fewer and fewer of his Gentile churches actually wanted to participate in this. Um, so that, but by and large, you're correct. The, Paul's letters don't really talk about this much. Hebrews doesn't talk about this. First, second John, first, first, second, third John, first, second Peter don't talk about it. You get into second century Christian writings. First Clement isn't really interested in this. Um, Justin Martyr, one of the great um, apologists of the second century, doesn't seem to be on his, horizon, his radar screen either. I think the reason for this is, as far as I can tell, this is our question, or at least my question. I'm asking this question, and the texts aren't, not many of them are actually addressing that. And why is that? I suspect it's because I have benefited my entire life from being a white male in North America. And I've been taught that I have uh, agency. I should be able to do things about change the world. I should be able to make difference in, in, the, in this, this democratic system that I'm in. 
most of these people that we're talking about in the ancient world did not share that idea of agency, uh, that it was possible to change things. And I think maybe that's at least, that's part of the explanation of why they address this question so much, or so little. Uh, it's my own sense of enfranchisement that makes me ask this question and wonder this about them. Uh, I think that's a wonderful way to conclude this. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, remind you, there are cookies and coffee if you have questions. Professor Furtick, I know you have one. You can ask it over that. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you, and let us thank our speaker, Stephen Friesen, one more time. <laughs> <laughs>